This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. Most parents want their child to get the best education possible. But for parents of children with disabilities, it can be an uphill battle. They often have to advocate for their child, and in some cases, they have to find a new school for them, one that's focused on special education. Like high rule schools, that's a group of eight state-approved and publicly funded private education programs. Right now, more than 300 students are enrolled at high road schools across Connecticut. But a new report shows several major issues happening at six of their eight schools. It also claims that the Connecticut State Department of Education failed to monitor these schools. The Connecticut Office of the Child Advocate and Disability Rights Connecticut were behind this multi-year investigation. And here we, with me now are Sarah Egan, she's the Connecticut Child Advocate, and Tom Koster, who's the Disability Advocate at Disability Rights Connecticut. Thank you both for joining us today, Sarah and Tom. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Sarah. And for our listeners, you can also join the conversation, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So, Sarah, before we get into the new report, I want to ask, you know, why do this investigation and how did high rule uh, schools get on your radar? Yes. Thanks for the question. So in Connecticut, uh, folks may not know that um, we have about 70 what are called state-approved private special education programs. These are publicly funded programs approved by the state that school districts contract with to serve children with disabilities who the districts have identified as having needs so significant they can't be met within the local public school system. Connecticut is actually the, the nation's um, largest user of these kinds of programs and outplaces more students than any other state in the country. High Roads, um, as you talked about in your introduction, has eight as has had eight such programs in the state of Connecticut, is one of the largest programs, um, serving hundreds of students each year, contracting with over three dozen school districts during the period we reviewed, and charging millions of dollars of public money. Um, and High Roads has been on the radar for a long time. Connecticut, as the state auditors have pointed out previously, has no um, published outcome measures or outcomes for any of these schools, leaving districts and parents in the position of really going by anecdote and word of mouth or observation to decide which such program might meet the needs of a child with disabilities. And the word of mouth on High Road for a long time, frankly, has been very poor. So our office has been aware of previous concerns. We have reported previous concerns to the state, um, including about some of the the issues we identified um, currently. And we've had complaints from parents. So, you know, as the state was reopening post-COVID and we had another complaint come in from a parent about their child's experience at one of the high road locations, we decided that it was time to conduct a a comprehensive review of what children were actually receiving in this program. And we reached out to our partners at Disability Rights Connecticut to do that jointly with them. And so this this happened a couple of years ago. So is this looking into the oversight, both oversight of the State Department of Education and high road schools? Yes. So what we wanted to see is, um, you know, who is being who are the children being served at these locations? What kind of needs do they have? What is their level of disability? Um, We wanted to understand the practices at the local school districts who are contracting for every student placed using public funds for every student placed. So we're looking at the services High Road provides, the contracting and oversight practices by the local school districts, and the oversight and approval practices by the state. Because again, it is the state that is essentially the overarching regulatory authority for these programs. So how well do they inspect what they expect was part of what we're looking at. And so I want to get into, you know, learning more about what exactly high road schools are. But uh, just in a moment, I want to just mention, too, that Where We Live did reach out to both the State Department of Education and high road schools about this report. The State Department of Education said the CSD vigorously disagrees with the conclusions drawn by the OCA and DRCT report regarding the CSDE's involvement with high road schools. As the CSD remains committed to upholding the standards of special education provision and ensuring accountability in all aspects of oversight responsibilities, and given the seriousness with which the CSDE takes its oversight duties, 
the CSD will treat the report as a formal state complaint. And High Road Schools also said, while we have concerns about the manner in which this investigation was conducted and challenge many of the findings in the resulting report, certain observations during the investigation process were constructive. We swiftly implemented changes in response to the feedback and shared those updates and their outcomes with OCA and DRCT. And just for our listeners, that the full responses to the report from both parties are available on our website at ctpublic.org slash where we live. So, Tom, I want to understand High Road School a little better. You know, our listeners might not be familiar with these programs. So can you tell us what High Road Schools are and how do they operate? Yeah, sure. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Um, the High Road Schools, again, as Sarah mentioned, is one of many approved private special education programs. Local school districts, um, you know, identify students that may not be able to be served in their home district. <clears throat> um, you know, it's our position that students should be served in their home district, right? The most inclusive um, and in in, the, in terms of special education law, least restrictive environment is a, a term of art in, in special education law. That's important that students get served in, in their home district to the extent possible. But the, a team determines, uh, you know, a team of the parents and the district and the staff determine that a student cannot be placed or cannot be served in their home district. So they look around for private schools. Now, High Road in particular, uh, again, these are schools that are segregated, right? They are, to, in our view, unnecessarily segregated. Um, but they're all students with disabilities, right? They're all students who have an individualized education plan, an IEP. Um, in the case of High Road, they mainly serve students with emotional disabilities, right? Um, so to, to Sarah's point earlier, you know, again, in Connecticut, we outplace, and as a state, the highest percentage of students with emotional disabilities, uh, or second highest, I should say, excuse me. 29.4% uh, of students with an IEP, with an emotional disability, uh, are placed in these separate segregated schools. So so, so High Road is one of those schools. It's, it's one of a number, but it's the biggest that, that serves that population. Um, so these students go there with behavioral challenges, right? Behavioral disabilities that need addressing. And uh, that requires uh, certain skill sets, certain staffing, um, certain services that those students are supposed to be providing. And the school districts, um, you know, are responsible. Ultimately, the school district that sends that, that home school district, whatever city or town in Connecticut, they're ultimately responsible for that student, right? Uh, wherever they get sent, uh, in this case, to High Road. So it's their responsibility, as we've been talking about, to, to oversee and monitor the placement of that student. Um, they didn't all see it that way, though. And we'll get into more of this later in the hour, but can you talk about who, who are the students that end up in these schools? Are, it seems from the stats that they're overwhelmingly low-income children of color, right? Yes, uh, and thanks for that question, because I think that's extremely important that we think who is getting outplaced the most to these schools. So, so across the board in the state, you know, it could run the gamut, right? But for high-road schools, it is primarily children from low income or poor school districts. Hartford is the largest user of high road by far of high road um, services with during our period of review, over 80 of the students came from Hartford. Hartford even got its own special rate, though let's keep in mind that these programs are very expensive. High road ranged from $220 a day to over $500 a day, not including any daily add-ons like a one-on-one -on -one or time with a, with a counselor, right? So we're talking millions of dollars a year just from Hartford Public Schools to High Road, and then some odd 35 other school districts, right? But primarily, it was students from low-income districts. Um, these were mostly children of color, mostly boys, as Tom said, mostly children with emotional disability or autism. And that is, autism is a growth industry for private equity-backed providers, like high roads. And I, and I hope we get a chance a little bit to talk about that because I'd like to respond to their statement that you they know, made. The only thing I'll add, Catherine, is, is it is the range of ages, right? So we're talking students as young as five, as the students as old as 22, right? So in, in Connecticut, students with disabilities receive services up to the age of 22. So it's the whole range. They have elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, transition programs for the 18 to the 22 population. So it's a whole range. And so, Sarah, I want to talk about the investigation a little bit because you mentioned earlier that you've been hearing about these problems in these schools for a while. It's been on the radar. Can you talk about what did the investigation look like? You know, you spend a lot of time in these schools seeing what's happening on the ground there. Can you tell us about that process? 
Yes. So our investigation, which uh, occurred over the course of about two years, um, included extensive review of all information related to staff hiring over a period of three years, credentials of staff, background checks of staff, where those occurred. Um, resumes of staff. We looked at data of, of all students served during the period of review, restraint and seclusion data, absenteeism data, um, how many children at High Road had a an individualized behavior plan. Um, we brought in a, cu- a couple of great expert organizations and experts, uh, to which I know you'll hear. We'll hear from uh, later this morning, Dr. Penny Spencer from St. Joe's, and our colleagues at the Center for Children with Special Needs, uh, Michael Powers, Mark Palmieri, and his team. These are some of the premier educational experts in the state of Connecticut to review. 30 records, complete records of students who had been served at High Road during the period of our of our review. We saw communications between High Road and the State Department of Education, between High Road and all school districts about staffing. Uh, we sought all information from the State Department of Education about their oversight and monitoring over a five-year period prior to the start of our investigation. So this, we conducted over a dozen site visits. Um, to mostly unannounced, mostly drop-in visits, which is really important to do and which often state regulators do not do. When state regulators go in, they're not going in unannounced typically. It is important to do these drop-in visits to see what's happening on the ground, conducted observations, talk to staff and administrators while we were there. So it was a very comprehensive process. Let me also say that we met with all of the stakeholders the Hartford Public Schools, a handful of other districts that we, where we sampled records, um, the High Road, uh, the State Department of Ed, multiple times in the development of this report and to review preliminary findings and concerns. And all entities had an opportunity to review multiple drafts of the report and to offer any factual corrections to the report before it was released. And let me underscore that, factual corrections not disagreements with the conclusions we made based on those facts, but factual corrections, of which very, very few were offered, but those that were were considered and changes were made. And so what did we find? Well, some of the most important things that we found were during the period of our review, almost half of the teachers employed at High Road, teaching students that were identified by school districts as so in need of specialized education that they could not be educated in the public schools. About half of those teachers lacked credentials to teach special education to children. We found that of a a number of individuals that were purported to be accredited permitted teachers, which is a process in Connecticut where you're not certified yet, but you can teach under supervision with a permit, that those uh, uh, documents didn't add up either. And we're not actually on file and complete with the State Department of Ed. We found that individuals who are identified as long-term subs by High Road, when we checked with the State Department of Education, also didn't have the proper paperwork on file. We found that 60 staff who worked directly with students, High Road could not demonstrate that they had conducted statutorily required background checks for And I raised some of those issues in particular because the lack of use of credentialed staff, the lack of appropriate paperwork to support individuals identified as having permits or long-term sub certification, and the lack, widespread lack of background checking indicates such widespread flagrant noncompliance with the most basic of state rules and regulations that it speaks volumes about the care around service delivery being provided to children at High Road, but also about how meaningful can the oversight from the State Department of Education, which has vigorously defended itself here, but how meaningful can the oversight be if these are the kind of flagrant, widespread noncompliance with state law that we see for some of our most vulnerable students? I mean, it really... It really defies the imagination to know what people are thinking with those responses. And and Tom, you were involved in these visits. Can you talk about what your experience was like? And also, uh, Sarah mentioned a lot about teachers and staffing, and and there's been a lot of reporting over the last couple of years. I mean, it goes back before the pandemic on teacher shortages across the board. Did you also get a sense that these schools were struggling to retain teachers? Yeah, thank you, Catherine. And and I think 
it, you know, it's, it's the thing we heard a lot, right? Well, it's a problem everywhere. And, you know, staffing is a problem. You know, finding educators is a problem. Finding any staff, finding special educators especially is a problem across the state. But this is not a, a typical school, right? This is a school that serves, that's contracted to serve um, students with, with high needs, right? With significant challenges. And, and the school districts are counting on, and, you know, we've heard things we trust, you know, we heard that from districts. We trust the schools. Um, we trust that the State Department of Ed has done their job and these these are approved programs. But there was, so it's, it's different, right? It's different for these students. These students need that trained, qualified stuff more than your your, your typical standard school, you know. Um, so, and, and, they, and they weren't providing it. So I think, you know, there's this level of trust both by the districts um, that send the students there and by the parents and families of those, of those students, right? They, they ex- there's an expectation that when my student gets sent to this private school, uh, special education school, that they're going to be staffed appropriately. So yes, we found that when we were talking to staff, we interviewed many staff during a course of our visits and, you know, we talked to them, you know, so where are you at? What's your certification? Oh, I'm a, I'm a sub, I'm a long-term sub. And, you know, to be fair, there, there were teachers there that were certified, certainly. And there were special education teachers that were good good teachers that were doing a good job in one classroom, but then they also had a responsibility to oversee, as Sarah mentioned, some of these permitted teachers or long-term subs get overseen by um, a special education certified teacher. So now they're in their classroom and they're also overseeing a couple of two or three other classrooms of, of teachers um, who aren't certified. And yeah, it's an issue. And you could see the difference clearly. You could see the difference between a classroom with students, um, with a, a trained certified teacher who's experienced and, and ones that are not. And it was stark. And when Sarah, you mentioned earlier that you saw, you know, teachers who were not certified or teachers who were, or tr- you know, training to be teachers on a permit that were teaching these classrooms. Can you talk about what does Connecticut law say about the training that the paraprofessionals and, and special education teachers need to receive before teaching in an actual classroom? Or Tom, you want to go for yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, I, I guess so. Um, for paraprofessionals, it's interesting. There's really not much there at all. You know, there's no training required. Um, you know, there are requirements to, to become a paraeducator, um, but they're pretty minimal as far as an associate's degree or something like that. So it's, it's pretty low. Uh, there are programs that you can go to to get, you know, some sort of level of training. Um, to our knowledge, the staff there didn't have much of that. As far as the, the permit ones, they're called DSAP, it's Durational Shortage Area Permit. And, uh, you know, they are required, and fill me in the blanks if I miss it, but they're required to uh, be in the process of obtaining a special education certification, right? So they need to be enrolled in a program to, to working toward special education certification. Um, so, it, and they have to receive it in a certain amount of time, and I can't remember exactly what that is. So, so they're working towards it, you know, and again, it's a shortage area, and, and certain, um, you know, uh, teaching uh, positions are allowed to do that, and special education is one of those. So, and they have to be working under the supervision, you know, of, of a trained and, or certified special education teacher. Well, and I want to ask too, you know, because you, you mentioned, of course, there are good teachers who are teaching <clears throat> in, in, in great classrooms, but there's also the opposite. Can you talk about the quality of education that the students were receiving in these classrooms? You know, what did the classrooms look like? Yeah, no, that's great. And, you know, honest, honestly, a, a lot of the reason these students are there, as we know, are, are they have behavioral challenges, right? And I can remember back to a, an administrator at one of the schools, you know, making this statement, these kids are here for behavior. They're not here for education, something to that effect, I'm paraphrasing. Um, and, and we found that when we put our eyes on the classrooms is that a lot of the students, there's such a focus on managing the behaviors and, and helping the students manage their behaviors that th- there was education going on, clearly, definitely. You know, they, they were educating the students, but not well <laughs> to, our, to our experience. And again, some classrooms doing a better job than others. Um, they had this rotational model where students would, uh, you know, spend some time with a teacher. Um, and then rotate and spend some time with a paraeducator and then some time working independently. And oftentimes what we saw when they were working independently is they were very, you know, off task. I mean, you can imagine that for any student, let alone one with behavioral challenges, um, you know, sleeping and, you know, just really off task, not, not doing their work. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's disturbing again because these students, in our view, and, and I think in, in best practices and professional opinion, should have behavior plans in place, right? They should have had behavior assessments done um, to determine what their needs are and behavior plans put in place. And we didn't see that. You know, it was here and there, but, but widespread, they didn't have those assessments done, didn't have those plans in place, which would have helped a lot, obviously. And I know Sarah mentioned earlier you also looked into attendance rates. So can you tell us what that looks like? <laughs> 
Wow. Yeah. Good. Sarah, you want to take this one? The attendance was, you know, uh, pretty horrendous. Yeah. So there was widespread chronic absenteeism across all the sites. And I think uh, going off the top of my head, actually, I don't have it written down here, but I think a, a, at least a quarter of the the students um, had missed 25 days or more of school. There were a significant number that had missed 50 or more days of school. And remember, these are uh, districts are paying by the day, hundreds of dollars a day for every child placed at High Road of public money. So the chronic absenteeism rates are, are were really concerning um, for these programs. And I just wanted to highlight one other thing about the teachers. So as Tom said, yes, you know, some of the observations that we did uh, went better than others, right? And there's certainly students who I'm sure were having a positive and are having a positive experience at Hyrule. It's the inconsistency around that that was so concerning and the lack of oversight and communication with parents about that. And I'll give you one example. One of our first site visits that we went into in a program went into a classroom that the on-site administrator identified as the autism classroom, right? Now, that was a designation later disputed by High Road corporate executives, but that's what the folks there at the school said. This is our autism classroom. Had, I'm sure, what's a lovely person running the classroom, but turned out was not a teacher, was not a certified special education teacher, did not have a permit, though later uh, High Road purported that the person did, but State Department of Ed said no, no permit, not a long-term sub for that program, not a teacher for that program, right? There's children in that program, children whose parents are relying and believing are getting special education. Let me add to that, that High Road could produce no documentation. While it pointed in meetings with us to, well, there's a statewide labor shortage, okay. But High Road is a for-profit company, private equity backed, that is contracting with local school districts to solve their problem about a labor shortage in the district saying, oh, we can solve it, give us the money, and we'll provide high expert special education services to your students. They could produce no documentation with contracting entities that they, they were having these staffing shortages, that there were classrooms being run by people that weren't teachers. I mean, that, that creates other legal concerns not just about whether students are receiving special education in accordance with their IEPs, but about whether this company is in compliance with the contracts that they are receiving from districts with public money. And I want to get into another data point before we go to break. Tom, you also found that these schools are using restraint and seclusion practices. Can you give listeners an idea of, you know, what does that mean? How was it used and how was it enforced? Yeah, so restraint and seclusion is something that, again, you know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of students experience, right? A lot of students across the state of Connecticut. It turns out that, you know, High Road School is, is one of many schools that, that, in our opinion, overuse, right? We would love to see restraints uh, eliminated entirely. But, you know, just just as way of an example, there was one year, I think it was the 2019-2020 year, and this is public public data, actually, that was provided by High Road, is they had over 1,200 instances of restraint and seclusion um, at their at their schools, which is a lot of students. Again, we're talking a population of about 300 students overall. In one school in particular, which is the Hartford uh, Primary and Middle School, they had uh, 543 instances of restraint and seclusion during that time, and that's for a population... 40 or 50, something in that ballpark of students. And, and these, now that school is, you know, five-year-olds up to, you know, maybe 13-year-olds or 14-year-olds. Um, so, you know, the the use is, is pretty rampant. Um, you know, there are a lot of laws that, that outline what that should look like and how that should go. They have these timeout rooms or break rooms, and they use a lot of different terms to describe them, but it's a small, you know, 10 by 10 room, um, you know, some padding on the wall to protect the, the student. Um, and, and again, these students are experiencing some behavior challenges and, and restraint and seclusion is, is an unfortunate um, uh, consequence of, of not managing the behaviors appropriately and doing behavior assessments, developing behavior plans. And if you're being proactive in how you interact with these students, I think we can you know, greatly reduce those numbers. You've been listening to Tom Kosker, who's the Disability Advocate at Disability Rights Connecticut, as well as Sarah Egan, who's the Connecticut Child Advocate. They're with us today to talk about a multi-year investigation into high road schools. Coming up next, we will hear from one of the investigators. And if you have a child in one of these schools, or if you've navigated special education in Connecticut, we want to hear from you. Give us a call, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live.
This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. Today, we're talking about a multi-year investigation into special education in Connecticut. A new report looks into High Road Schools, which is a group of privately run, publicly funded schools serving children with behavioral issues in our state. The report cites overuse of isolation and restraint, teachers without certifications, and a lack of oversight from the Department of Education. And with us are two of the people behind the report. We have Sarah Egan, who's the Connecticut Child Advocate, and Tom Kosker, who's the Disability Advocate at Disability Rights Connecticut. And I want to invite our listeners to give us a call, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. I want to share a quick note from a caller, Mary from East Haven. She says her daughter goes to High Road in Connecticut and would like to give her opinion. She's had a very good experience with her daughter at the school, says she's hearing a lot of bad things and want to share some of the nice things. Well, thank you so much, Mary, for taking the time and sharing your experience with us. And yesterday, we also received a statement from High Road Schools regarding this report. They shared... High Road schools have found the two-year investigative process led by the agencies to be biased and the resulting report misleading. As we learned of observations and findings early in the investigation, we moved swiftly to implement changes and provided detailed corrective actions in writing to DRCT and OCA. No reference, however, to those changes or their outcomes are mentioned in the report. So, Sarah, can you respond to this statement? Yes. So it's false Mm -hmm. in the sense that um, that uh, High Road met with us, had an opportunity multiple times to offer factual corrections to the report. And we offered them both verbally and in writing an opportunity to provide um, a statement and response to summarize any of the corrective actions that they took. Uh, We reiterated that in a meeting. We reiterated that in in, in emails. they had initially said to us, oh, we want you to see those things in the report. We said, look, that's for you to summarize, and we'll append it to the report. We'll include it with our release. Um, so to, if there's any suggestion that that opportunity was not offered, that is categorically false. I would also say that, um, look, it's easy to say, hey, that's inaccurate. You're biased. What what their statements um, did to the public, um, to reporters and to parents, did not say is what was false. The findings that half of the teachers during a three-year period were not credentialed, the finding that OCA and DRCT made that individuals they claimed to have permits or long-term sub-permits actually didn't when we checked with the State Department of Ed, the finding that um, 60 staff working with children could not be demonstrated that they were background checked. So they did not claiming that any of those facts are false. What they're concerned about is that our findings, uh, they're, they're concerned about our conclusions, right? And, and, and okay. But let's keep in mind that High Road is owned by um, Special Education Services, Inc., which is owned by Full Bloom, which is owned by American Securities Private Equity Fund, which purchased Full Bloom a couple of years ago for hundreds of millions of dollars. And this is part of a trend in human services to vulnerable people, including children. The, the use of private equity dollars to buy out programs Um, and profit off of service delivery to vulnerable people, right? Well, anybody in the human service and nonprofit business in the state of Connecticut can tell you that there's barely enough dollars to support the delivery of care to vulnerable people, but somehow corporations like Full Bloom and High Road have have, have figured out how to make money off of it. Okay. So this report didn't just fault High Road. It also pointed to a lack of oversight by the State Department of Education, as you mentioned earlier, Sarah. Can you tell us more about that and explain what oversight should have been happening to make sure that these students were getting the education that they needed? Let's start with how often does somebody go out to High Road and look under the hood at either the state or local level? And and the findings that we made, right, and I, I know I've reiterated them several times around staffing and background checking, but those are the basics, right? Is a teacher teaching my child When we talk about commitment, just to back up for a second, Carolyn, we talked about lack of communication with school districts. We think about that autism classroom. There's no communication with the parents. If I'm a parent and I'm sending my young child who has autism or maybe communication impaired, maybe nonverbal, um, to a classroom, I am trusting that they are receiving safe, high-quality care from a supervised and credentialed program. That was not occurring, not in every classroom, as Tom said, but in a number of them. And that that is a betrayal 
of parents who are trusting programs to educate their most precious part of their family, right? So I wanted to underscore that. So who is looking under the hood? I bring up those examples because that can only happen in an industry where no one is looking under the hood. Otherwise, you background check and you have your documentation. Your HR files are in order. Your certifications are in order, right? You can only do that when you know nobody is really looking. So how often do people go out? State Department of of Education will go out every three to five years. Now, they will go out and do what's called a mid-cycle review if they get a complaint. And they've done that a couple of times with Hyrule. In fact, once after a complaint the OCA made about when we found an individual teaching in one of the sites who was actually on the central registry for, for previous findings of child abuse and neglect. And DCF told us there was no record of anybody having requested a background check from Hyrule. So State Department of Ed went out. They dinged them for the background check. Hyrule said, oh, we're going to do an audit. We're going to make sure everything, everybody gets background checked. Well, that obviously didn't happen. And when we asked for all the documentation from State Department of Ed, what they could produce was we followed up on OCA's complaint. We asked for a corrective action. High Road said they, they're going to do an audit. Then nothing. Nobody goes back out to make sure it happened. Nobody goes back out to say, did you implement the corrective action? There's no 30-day follow-up, right? And, and of course there wasn't because when DRCT and OCA went out, over the next couple of years and looked, none of those things had actually been fixed. So you can't have an, a system, an industry that serves highly vulnerable people, whether it's people with disabilities, whether it's adults, whether it's children, whether it's child care centers, that somebody is not going out to every single year unannounced and looking at the, looking under the hood. Child care centers, the law requires somebody goes out every year. DCF goes out to its facilities multiple times a year and looks, not always unannounced, but they're going regularly. Can't have state-regulated programs for kids with disabilities that somebody goes out to every three years. And I just want a quick reminder for our listeners that you can also join the conversation, 888-720-9677. I'm going to take a quick call from Jennifer Johnson from Wallingford. She's a regional director at High Road and wants to share her own experience with this. Jennifer, you're on the air, and if you can be brief, that would be great. Hi, thank you so much for taking my call today. I've obviously been listening in and have been a part of this investigation from the beginning, and Speaking from personal experience today, not as a representative of the company, I do disagree with a lot of the statements that are being made. And I think as a parent um, of three children myself, as an educator for the last 18 years, working for High Road for the last nine years, I fully support our programming and what we do for students. I believe that what we do is really, really good work. And unfortunately, what's being said today does not highlight that. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer, for calling us and sharing your experience. Sarah, can you respond to what Jennifer has to say? Um, Well, I certainly appreciate her call in. I'm not sure how to respond to that. Obviously, she's employed by high road schools. Yeah, um, I'd say a lot of people feel, some people feel the way she does. Um, I think many people um, don't get to see what we saw in our investigation, right? And um, that's what we're here to bring to light, right, is the lack of monitoring, the lack of oversight by districts. Um, Parents trust um, we're here to do our job, which is to make sure that these places and and these folks um, are being looked at. And, and, and we did that, you know, and we did that and we stand by our report and we stand by what we found in our investigations. Um, and, uh, and we have some recommendations um, to move forward uh, as well. Go for it. So, thanks. Thanks, mm-hmm. Sarah. Of course, I always think of things, uh, additional things I want to highlight. Um, you know, thinking about, you know, Jennifer Johnson is, is one of the regional administrators and it made me think about one of our administrative findings. You know, one of the programs that High Road opened a few years back is a is a High Road um, Wyndham County, which they opened as a satellite of Hartford. Um, and our finding was that the State Department of Education never visited that program in the three years that it had first opened. And when we went out to do a drop-in visit, um, there was no credentialed administrator on site there. There was an individual who claimed to be the principal, but who turned out was not certified as a principal in the state of Connecticut, who then we were later told isn't a principal, but he's a operations director, which doesn't require a certification, which meant that there was no principal on site, right? You see where I'm going. Um, and But that individual told us that day, 
when we talked about academic goals, we talked about what they're working on with kids. And he said to our investigator, these children don't have academic goals. They're here for behavior. That's a serious problem, right, coming from someone claiming to be the principal on site. Um, one of the other staffing things that we found, Carolyn, we haven't talked about today, is that when we asked for three years' worth of who are all the teachers that you have, what we didn't see on the list were any certified music teachers, any certified art teachers, any certified gym teachers, right? These are things that when, when you have a child in the public schools that, that they get, that's part of being a child. It's part of being educated, Right? It's part of what the law requires yeah, for and, children and in and public I'll just, schools. I'll just quickly add to that. I know we have to move on, but you know, that's a lack of equal educational opportunity for these students, right? These students with disabilities are not being provided an equal educational opportunity in these separate segregated schools. They don't get the same opportunities for college prep classes, for again, the arts, the sciences, the musics, and stuff like that. They do the minimum, they do the educating on math and reading. Um, and, and, and they're certainly trying in that regard, but a lot of these things, it's not an equal opportunity as they would in their home district. Well, and a quick follow-up to that, we have to go to break, but before that, um, I want to ask, because we mentioned earlier that the overwhelming majority of students uh, at these schools are male and lower-income students of color, based on the report. Tom, does this point to a bigger systemic issue in, in the way children are diagnosed with emotional disability and behavioral problems, and what should those conversations look like? Yeah, I think it, it, it's two-part. There's, there's an issue with the diagnosis and, and labeling of students with emotional disabilities. Certainly, they are um, diagnosed at a higher rate for students of color. Um, but the other thing is it's not providing those services in district, right? So it's a lack of resources. It's a lack of um, uh, capacity. We heard that many times. You know, Why are you outplacing the student to high road or otherwise? We don't have the capacity in district. Well, that's the wrong answer. You need to find the capacity. You're spending, you know, thousands, 80, 100, thousands of dollars to send these students there. That money should be used to keep the students in district, least restrictive environment, and provide those supports and services uh, close to home, right, close in your neighborhood schools. You've been listening to uh, Tom Koster, who's a disability advocate at Disability Rights in Connecticut, and Sarah Egan, the Connecticut Child Advocate, and they'll be They'll both be staying with us. Coming up, this report highlights recommendations that could help schools better serve this student population. Stay with us. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. This hour, we've been talking about a multi-year investigation into the Connecticut State Department of Education and High Road Schools, one of the largest state-approved private special education providers. The report shows a lack of oversight and several systemic issues at the schools, but the report also suggests some concrete recommendations for improvement. And with us still is Sarah Egan, who's the Connecticut Child Advocate, and Tom Kosker, who's the Disability Advocate at Disability Rights Connecticut. And joining us now is Penny Spencer. She's an educational consultant, also associate professor with the Department of Education at the University of St. Joseph. And she worked as an investigator on this report. Penny, welcome to where we live today. Thank you. It's nice to be here. It's nice to have you with us as well. And before we get started, I do want to just share, we have heard from a few parents this hour with children who go to high school, high rolled schools. Shelby shared, she works with kids with behavioral issues and says it's frustrating to listen to this as a parent. She's had a positive experience with a school. And Chris from East Haven also shared his son was at High Road for three years. His son is now back in public schools and is thriving. Doesn't think that would have been possible with High Road. Thank you so much, Chris and Shelby, for uh, sharing both of your experiences with us. And Penny, you've been listening to the conversation with uh, Tom and Sarah. Can you talk about were there things that jumped out to you that you would like to respond? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I think Sarah and, and Tom have both spoken um, very, very directly about the lack of qualified teachers and paraprofessionals. And along with that, I would say that while, pe while teachers were um, minimally qualified in many in many instances and not not certified in special education. There was very little evidence that the uh, High Roads was providing supportive professional development that would have addressed or helped to build skills in, in the people who were actually teaching in the classroom. I also want to say that um, 
that we did see evidence of caring teachers who really cared about the kids and who would like to see them to be successful. But speaking about those children, um, the we've talked about them as vulnerable, we've talked about them as having behavior disorders, but I just want to clarify the fact that these children, or to emphasize the fact that these children were too complex in terms of their needs and the severity of their needs to be effectively educated in school districts. And just to speak a bit more about that, uh, these are children with histories of significant and continuing trauma uh, which we know affects brain development, affects both learning and behavior. Um, and there was little evidence that the education they were receiving uh, was being provided from a trauma-informed perspective. Um, many had uh, mental health disorders, including um, severe depression, anxiety, um, internalizing disorders as opposed to the the externalizing kinds of aggression and disruption for which they were frequently, um, the f focus in the, in the program was frequently on those disruptive and aggressive behaviors without particular attention to the underlying anxiety and depression that many of the children served. Uh, um, well, and then you know, characteristic, right? And then with their... with what you're describing too, we also know that special education law requires that students are educated in the least restrictive environment appropriate. Can you talk about that a little bit? And also, students with disability also have a right to comprehension uh, or comprehensive education, right? So, in your opinion, was that met? Well, the uh, the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, requires that that students with disabilities have comprehensive evaluations. And that means that they are evaluated in any particular area which might be impacting their ability to learn, to interact socially, and to be successful in school. Um, those comprehensive evaluations in the records that I reviewed did not, did not appear. Um, in many cases, students with behavioral uh, and emotional disorders have underlying language disabilities. Um, there, there was not a... Um, a consistent speech and language consultation. There was no consistent psychological uh, consultation available to the programs uh, that, that we reviewed. Um, in addition, uh, m a number of students were hospitalized in psychiatric settings during the course of their time at High Roads. Um, they returned to the school uh, without any ongoing psychiatric consultation or assistance to the program, to the teachers, uh, in terms of how best to meet their needs given their post-hospitalization uh, situation. So that ability to structure a, a comprehensive special education program was very difficult and, and impossible to, to accomplish without the evaluations and the consistent participation and follow-up of related, related service personnel, including psychologists, speech and language therapists, OTs, and so on. Uh, typically, that uh, those services were provided by reaching out to the school district to have them send one of their personnel to, to do an evaluation. That's entirely different from having someone who is knowledgeable about the program, who is able to spend considerable time working with teachers and paraprofessionals and guiding them in terms of best practice in working with children with autism, uh, mental health disorders, behavior disorders, and underlying ang a academic problems. Um, because I think there, was a, there appears to be a lack of understanding of the relationship between academic disorders and delays and behavior, and it works both ways. If you are frustrated daily and trying to do a task in school that you cannot do, uh, the frustration is going to in increase and, and appear in various ways um, behaviorally. Um, so the ability to provide intensive reading instruction, for example, was not part of um, any of the programs that we observed. There was no uh, ongoing consultation for intensive reading intervention. Um, and 
I would I would just add one other thing, um, and that is the environments themselves were not conducive to helping children to engage with learning. Uh, there were frequently classrooms where there were no books. There were no instructional materials, no manipulatives for math. Uh, the classrooms were very barren in terms of how they might, in a best practice program, support children's learning and engagement with education. Well, and especially with what Penny just shared, we only have a couple of minutes, but I want to ask Sarah and Tom, um, I want to end to talk about the recommendations in the report. You know, what are some of the priorities that you think that needs to be addressed? And can you also talk about whether or not there's a timeline? Let's go with uh, Tom first. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. Um, so I'll hit on a couple. There's many in the report, as you said, you posted on, on the website. But n number one would be strengthened oversight, you know, strengthened oversight by the State Department of Ed uh, into these uh, separate schools, these special education programs. Um, you know, that includes, you know, annual site inspections, you know, visits, um, follow up on corrective action plans, um, parent involvement, parent questionnaires. Um, so definitely that piece. Um, the second piece is requiring specific monitoring by the school districts. That that are sending students there, right? Um, they see it as the state's responsibility. The states do some, as we said, every three to five years, but it's not enough. So requiring specific monitoring by school districts of the students that they send um, there. Um, and, and a third quick one I'll add, again, this is just picking a few out of the list, is requiring schools to notify parents and districts about staffing concerns et cetera, when they have them that they should be aware of, you know, when their, their student is being taught by a non-certified teacher. So there's a few. So Sarah, recommendations, you admit yeah. it. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we consulted with uh, Dr. Uh, Ross Green from Lives of the Balance and his colleagues. He's the uh, creator and author of Collaborative po Problem Solving, which is a trauma-informed um, methodology for working with children. And, and he helped fashion some of these recommendations as well. Um, and uh, yeah, we didn't talk a lot about the local school districts. So the majority of which we spoke to never observed education once they placed a child at High Road um, and relied almost exclusively on data and reports from High Road schools to monitor progress for these very expensive programs. So having the state uh, work with school district to create a template for local oversight um, and requiring more due diligence by the local school districts for the public dollars that they're expending on behalf of vulnerable children and families is going to be really important. I think given the statements we've received from State Department of Ed and High Road, we have a tough road to hoe going forward, though. Well, thank you so much for that. You've been listening to Sarah Egan, who's the Connecticut Child Advocate. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. Thanks very much. You're also listening to Tom Kosker, who's the Disability Advocate at Disability Rights Connecticut. Thanks, Tom, for being with us. Thank you, Kevin. And also many thanks to Penny Spencer, who is from the University of St. Joseph. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you. And we, uh, once again, just want to remind our listeners that we do have the full responses from the State Department of Education and High Road Schools uh, reports on our website, ctpublic.org slash where we live. I'm Catherine Shen. Today's show is produced by Tess Terrible. Our technical producer is Dylan Reyes. Download Where We Live anytime on your favorite podcast app. And thank you so much for listening.